probably getting close to a hundred requests, I would say, um, mm. to have you on M. Uh, oh, what is I your disability? Uh, so I have a spinal cord injury. Um, so the technical term would be incomplete paraplegic. Okay, nice. We'll delve into, you know, your story and that pretty soon. But I've got to ask you, what what's it like? You are like a, a big deal online. You have some big people that follow you. You're famous. You're way more famous than Angus, as I mentioned. How do you, you know, what, what was that change like for you now being in the public eye? And one thing I really like about your Instagram as well is nothing is, you know, off limits. You really delve into your life, which is a great thing. And we're going to do that as well. Um, but was that like a bit of a change for you to able to do that? Uh, to be honest, I genuinely don't feel that at all. So when I first started using Instagram, it was just like a diary for me. So I love to write. And ever since I had my accident, I've just written huge paragraphs, basically diary entries about whatever it was I was going through and started sharing them on social media. I have no idea how that came to be, but I just started doing it. And because in the beginning there was no one following me, I was just so upfront and honest with whatever I was feeling. Mm. And it just hasn't changed ever since. I just... Yeah, I don't know. I don't see the point to be anything but open and honest and vulnerable with w what I'm going through. So It is interesting because Instagram can be a vapid little society where, you know, people mm -hmm. only post the greatest photos of themselves and pretend the world's amazing. But I have always treated it like a modern day photo album. So our parents have those sleeves with old Polaroid pictures. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, I, I, you know I'm probably, a I'm a dad now. Um, so for me, it's, you know, passing, my daughter's going to look in, 10, 15 years and go, oh my God, dad, you know, Katy Perry, who's probably an ancient artist now, you once met her. It's like a modern day, you know. <laughs> Katy but, of all the people to come in your head, you went with Katy Perry. I don't know. Is Katy Perry still going to be making music, pop music by the time my daughter can appreciate it? I would have went with Harry Styles personally. Okay. That's You've a met Harry point. Styles. You should have hey. definitely Hang gone on, he's got his, Harry Styles. He's got his, there's a chat for another time. He's got his phone number. Like they're, they're proper Are phones. It's a, I think it's disconnected. It was a very old phone number. <laughs> But the, the, you know, that's it. so true because you don't know what your Instagram's going to be. For, so for yeah. me, I just treated it like a, a photo album. And for you, you've treated it like a diary entry. Like an, you know, yeah. I found that really interesting. Yeah, a great way to look at it. Yeah, it's so true because when, when I go back and look through it, which is very rare that I look through my own, but it's so nice to read things that I've written years ago that mm. I probably would have forgot otherwise. We said at the start how many times you've been requested, like literally hundreds of times. How does that make you feel to know that people really want to hear from you and that you have such a big supporter base. I feel honored. And to be honest, when you guys first asked me to come on here, I was reluctant. And this is what I said to my friends only because to be honest, out of any group of people that I feel most nervous talking to, it's the disability community because a part of me, and I know this is just in my own head, but I think because I have healed so much as we'll get into, I kind of feel a little bit of guilt for that. And I wonder if I'm still, I don't know, welcome to speak. Uh, in that community. I think that's going to be a space that we do definitely playing at length mm -hmm. coming up yeah. for sure. And I can, I can feel what, what you're thinking there because the disabled community, although I'm a part of it and I love being a part of it, it can be mm -hmm. pretty brutal sometimes, can't it? Oh, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel that. I haven't experienced that, but more so I just wonder like, what do I have to offer mm. um, that, and you know, and I've listened to a few of your episodes as well. And I'm like, wow, these people are going through such things that I can't even fathom. And I just wonder if I have anything to offer in that realm. And I know I do, but I think it's just something that in my head, I, I get a bit nervous about it. Did you uh, subscribe and write a comment? Because it really helps the algorithm when you listen. I didn't know you could subscribe to a podcast. Hey, subscribe to the podcast. <laughs> well, I mean, don't listen to very many podcasts. Oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know how they work. <laughs> it's very true. And it is something we are going to go into depth about because technically you have, you're the same as Dylan. You're an incomplete paraplegic. However, mm -hmm. you live two very different big lives. Yeah. Uh, let's find out how about the accident itself and, and yeah. hear from your story. Before that, can we talk about just who, who you were before your accident? Like, I'm obviously the same person, but just a bit of a snapshot into your life about, you know, what you were doing, how old you were, you know, the things yeah. you loved. Okay. So to be honest, I feel like a complete different person from who I was before I had my accident. So I was only 20. And before my accident, I was kind of, well, I'll set the scene. I was just working all these random jobs, saving up for like a gap year. I was going to travel for the year. Um, but who I was as a person, I wasn't very, I wasn't a positive person, I'll say. I was someone who kind of just took everything for granted and didn't, just didn't appreciate what I had and wasn't really filled with any kind of joy. I was just kind of going through the motions and I don't feel that way at all now. And I don't relate to that person at all, but yeah, I don't know. It's it's even weird. I feel like there's a distinct before and after in my life from that day. 
And sometimes I even find it hard to remember the person I was beforehand. Wow. Did you know anything about disability or anything pre your accident? Not, not at all. Mm. Not at all. And I think that's why when it happened, which we'll talk about, but I was, I was so scared because I didn't have anyone to look to for, you know, inspiration or guidance. I didn't, I didn't know anyone or anything about it. So 20 years old, um, you decided to take a skydiving. Yes. Yes. So I was in Switzerland. I was on the said gap trip and I'd, I'd always wanted to skydive. And for some reason, I'd always wanted to skydive in this particular place in Switzerland. Don't know why I'd never been there before, but I just had it in my head that that's what I wanted to do and wasn't nervous for it or anything. Cause I was just like, loved stuff like that. Adrenaline junkie. So we did it. I did it with my best friend, Gemma, and she absolutely was hating the whole experience. I forced <laughs> her into it. So thank God nothing happened to her. <laughs> Um, but anyway, we did the jump and I was absolutely loving it. Like, have you guys done it? Well, funnily enough, I've done the exact same company Stop. that you have. It's in, really? like, is in it Louder 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 yeah. 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 So jumping out of the helicopter, uh, you were on a top deck tour. Yeah. Top yeah, deck. It's actually, oh wow. It's funny how many people from Australia have done it there. Hey, because the Kentucky and top deck trips, they all go through there and they all do it with that company. So yeah. a mate of mine yeah. did it as well. I'll tell you his story, um, afterwards. Emma, you could not pay me enough money to skydive. I, really? I like, because... I'm, I'm like a, I'll try everything kind of guy, you know, but I just have no desire to do it because just so much shit can go wrong. I don't <laughs> think this story is going to help. I know. Yeah, yeah. I think you'll be locked into that view <laughs> after you hear this. <laughs> but yeah, so but funnily for, enough, yeah. when I heard your story, I was like, wow. And I text my, my, my best mate, Matt Poole, who I did it with. And yeah. I went, wow, mate, this happened on the exact same trip. And he sent a photo of him on the day and he goes, would we go back and change it had we known about this? And I said, I think we would have. Was it before or after me, I wonder? Um, so yours yours was seven years ago? Yeah. I would have been, I reckon, the same time. Oh, wow. That's yeah. scary. Yeah. Mm. Actually, that... I think it probably, it, I would have been, yeah, it would have been probably the same year. Wow. That's interesting. Well, you got to tell us what happened. Oh, yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> you could have been so... like, and then I landed fine. <laughs> and now I think what a great episode. See you later. It was really fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, but first of all, I'd just like to say anyone wanting to skydive, not against skydiving, you should still do it. Because as I was falling, I just remember thinking it was the most amazing feeling I'd ever felt, loved it. And I remember thinking, I'm going to become a skydiver. That's how much I loved it. Mm. And that was until, um, so the instructor taps you on the shoulder when they're going to pull the chute. And so he tapped me on the shoulder. So I knew it was coming, but then nothing changed. We didn't slow down at all. He didn't give me any other signal. And I could kind of feel a jolt, but we didn't slow down after the jolt. So I was like, okay, that's interesting. And I could also feel like my hair get ripped backwards. And I was like, why does no one warn you that it hurts when you skydive? Like, why does no one warn you that your hair gets pulled out? So anyway, we're still falling. And because I'd never done it for, before, I had nothing to compare it yeah. to. So I didn't immediately think, oh, something's wrong. It actually took me quite a while to realize that. But and so he wasn't I've, communicating. Can you hear him talk? Is he that close or? Yeah. Well, he, I could hear him before that during the fall, but so that's one of the reasons that I figured out something was wrong. So I was way, I was yelling out to him. I was like, are we good? Like when's, mm. when are you pulling the parachute? And he wasn't answering at all. And I was like, okay, maybe it's just like the wind and I can't hear him. Um, and then I, I've seen videos of it where you obviously like sway to the side and you slowly glide down. Mm. And I was like, Hey, we're still going straight down. And then the moment when I did realize was when I saw our parachute in front of us tangled up in a ball, not at all above us and not at all open, not even looking like it could open, literally just tangled up in a ball. And I was like, okay, something's definitely wrong. And then the closer we got to the ground, um, I was like, even if it was to open, surely there's not enough time for it to slow down. So I just, I just realized the speed that we were going and how close the ground was, I was like, oh, we're, we're about to hit. Like, this is it. And I was just in complete and utter shock because I, I didn't even have any fear going into the skydive. It didn't cross my mind that something could go wrong. So, I mean, what's going through your head? Are you adrenaline? We're all going to be fine. Are you praying? How fast does it go? Does it seem like it goes quick or is time kind of slow down? Yeah. It's like time didn't exist. So it went, it would have only been, I don't know, like a minute or two at, mo at most, 
but it seemed mm. so slow in my head that I had so many times to think all of these thoughts. Yet at the same time, it went so fast. So I know there was no part of me that was like, we'll be fine. Not at all. Like if you could feel the speed we were going and see the ground, you would just think it's completely insurvivable. Is that a word? <laughs> hey, makes sense to us. It is now. The Oxford Dictionary is a big fan of our podcast. <laughs> but yeah, you're jumping. You you're jumping from you know. I've done the same thing. You're out of that helicopter like ten thousand, fourteen thousand feet, whatever they drop you out at. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, something's got to change though. There's there's got to be some parachute. The second shoot flies. Exactly. So so what happened? And I didn't realize this at the time. Um, but basically, there's two parachutes in the backpack. And just I didn't mention this before, but this is tandem. So the instructors in control and yeah, I had nothing to do with it. So I, I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know how skydiving works, but there's two parachutes in his backpack. There's the one which comes out when he pulls it and normally that's all you need, but there is also an emergency one in there that comes out automatically when you reach a certain altitude, only if the other parachute isn't out for whatever reason. Yeah. So he's got an altimeter, I think it's called on his wrist and it's yes. an auto deployment, but also that second shoot, um, is not the same as the first shoot. It's smaller, it's, no, I guess. It's smaller and there's no maneuverability. There's no sway side to side. It's just meant to get you to the ground okay. semi-safe. Yeah, yeah. So two different shoots. And what happened was um, my instructor pulled our parachute too late. And at the time that he did pull it, happened to be the exact same time that the emergency shoot was coming out automatically. And so because oh it was God. the same ta time, they got all tangled together. <gasps> And as they were coming out and tangling, the cords actually wrapped around the instructor's neck and strangled him. So he was unconscious for the entire fall, which explains why he wasn't answering me, explains why he couldn't untangle them or why he couldn't cut one shoot off or whatever they would normally do in that situation. So he, yeah, he was completely unconscious and the, the shoot was completely not doing anything. So, and I, but cause I didn't realize he was unconscious. I, I was in the beginning kind of waiting for him to... Mm -hmm. To, to do something. But then when we got to the closer, I was like, nah, this, this is it. So did he survive? Yeah, he survived. Oh um, I have absolutely no idea how he survived being strangled by the weight of a parachute, but he, he was very injured upon landing as well. I'm pretty sure he's okay now, but yeah, he survived. Wow. So something must have in that moment with the parachute come clean, like come out a little bit to give you some sort of, you know, speed reduction to, to get no. to the ground. No, what? we just, yeah, it was, it was in front of us, like not, not at all above us, slowing us what? down. Yeah. So I have no idea scientifically Whoa. how we survived. So yeah. what? Absolutely no idea. You just hit the ground. What did you hit? Yeah. What did you land on? Um, so we landed in a field. So we're in the Swiss Alps, just on this grass field. Um, but right next to us, probably like two meters away was a big bitumen road. So super lucky, first of all, that we didn't land on the road. Also lucky that we didn't land in any of the cliffs or trees or rivers yeah, or anything that's course. in the Swiss Alps, yeah. because we didn't land where we were supposed to. We were, I think, a kilometer from where we were meant to be. So we could have gone any direction. But the people on the ground could see that you were changing direction and they chased you down or did? No. So I, when we landed... I didn't know. So when I landed on the ground, I landed on my belly and the instructor landed on top of me oh my God, and he man. was, yeah. And he was still unconscious. So in my mind, I thought he was dead. So I was like, okay, it's up to me here to go and get help. So when I was like looking, I was pinned down by him, but I was kind of using my neck to look around and I was like, there's absolutely no people around. And also we're in the middle of the Swiss Alps. How are we going to get found? And so I think how it, how it worked out in the end was I was Gemma, who I was skydiving with. They jumped after me and her instructor must have seen it happen and followed us down. Oh, so yeah. until they got there, we were just alone. There was no one around. Okay. So do you not fall unconscious when you landed? No, How that's the, that's the wildest the thing. Did you stay about conscious? It. That is I know. Don't know. Awake for the whole thing. And you knew broken. Could you feel your legs lack of sensation straight away or? Yeah, no. So it was in that moment where I was, where I realized there was no one around and I knew I had to go and get help. And when I tried to um, roll over to, first of all, roll him off me mm. and tried to stand up, that's when I realized. And that was the moment where I was like, I, I just couldn't understand at first because as you said, I was awake for the whole thing. So how could I suddenly go from being able to walk and being able to do mm. anything and feel my entire body to literally the next second? not being able to even wriggle my toes. I couldn't even use my abs to, to roll, to get him off me. It was the weirdest, like most inexplainable feeling. Mm. 
team out of mine who I went to the wheelchair basketball world championships, Michael D'Amelio was skydiving in the Swiss Alps with the same company and the instructor landed on him the same as you, what? used him as a pillow and he broke his back complete T6 and he's in a wheelchair, same company. And, uh, he was, he was for years trying to get a payout for negligence and he eventually got it. And I said, when you get your money, you owe me a $10,000 day. Cause it was a bit, uh, of just partying in the city. Still waiting for my ten thousand dollar day. <laughs> he uh, put it towards his kids' education, which is probably better. But Pro I was gonna, probably, I'll, I mean, selfish. But well, well, did you, was the company liable for that with you? Yeah, okay. yeah, be, because the instructor admitted, and it was found that he was at fault. Oh wow! Yeah, so for a few different reasons. And I mean, we like to talk about the whole process of healing, I guess. And so yeah. with that, um, there's obviously emotional scars and physical scars. To this day, do you hold some sort of resentment towards yeah. that instructor? Um, to be honest, not for, I spoke about this recently actually, but I don't feel any resentment for the actual accident itself. Like we're all human, accidents happen. And in a job like that, it just happens that if you do make a mistake, it could be deadly or it yeah. could be life changing like it was for me. Mm. So the actual incident itself, no, I feel fine about that, but it's more so how he's handled it afterwards, yeah. which I'm not. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like if people uh, can own up to their mistakes and they can, you know, I don't know, just be human and decent about it, then that's okay. But it's the the handling of it, which kind of still makes me mad sometimes. What do you mean by that? So were they non-apologetic? Did they try and fight it in court? What happened? No, never. I've never got an apology or anything. Fuck off. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty bad. No way. Yeah. That is shit ass. Yeah. Yeah, because obviously like he's admitted like, fault. There's fault there and he's admitted to that, but to uh, not have the you know, personality yeah. to be able yeah. to yeah. admit fault like, technically, but not personally. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot I could say about it, but I don't know yeah. if I'm actually allowed no, no, that's legally fair enough. to talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, one thing that I, I love about being disabled in Australia is we have great doctors and if something happens, we're in a good place. Yeah. Go, could not be anything more scary, I imagine, than breaking your back in another country. Mm. So yes, that at first. At, yeah, but, so what was it like for you? Yeah, well, at first terrifying because I everyone was speaking Swiss German. Mm. So I couldn't even, I didn't know what was happening. How so is as you, I how was. How your Swiss, Swiss German? All I know is. Nine? Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you so, know it's hello. Hello. That's, 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 that's English. It's, hello. Hello. Oh, it's hello. different. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Apologies. <laughs> oh, good stuff. <laughs> so as I was laying there, uh, we had to wait for an emergency helicopter to come. And once they did come, it was still a whole big process of, I, I feel like I was on the ground for hours, wow. hours, genuinely. Um, and so the people that were around me then, I was just, I was hysterical, obviously, because I just couldn't wrap my head around such a big change in such a short amount of time. Mm. So I was just asking questions like, will I be able to walk again? Like, that's mm. all I kept saying. And I couldn't get an answer because no one was speaking English. So it was very scary at first to just have absolutely no idea what was happening. I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me in my head that I'd broken my back. Like I didn't know at all what had happened and no one could give me answers. So that was terrifying. But I will say once I actually did get to hospital and my family flew over and I had people that I could talk to and there were English speaking doctors and nurses mm. in the hospital, it was actually probably the best place in the world to be. Mm. Like Switzerland is amazing and the medical system was absolutely phenomenal. So it was, yeah, like. Probably one of the best places you could be. Not good in a war, it, but great when it hey, comes to. It did, <laughs> hey, created Roger Federer. Oh, God. That's a good oh, thing. Not everything comes thing. back to tennis. I mean, let's try and make it like that. <laughs> okay. So can we talk about um, the support that you had in that moment? Because you are hysterical. Um, you know, you, you said you can move your neck around to have a look, but apart from that, uh, mm -hmm. there's so much confusion. So can you talk about how much of a, uh, how much Gemma was? What was she like in that moment? Yeah, she was amazing. So she just even though she was feeling the same fear and like there was no one that she could talk to either. She just totally took control of the situation and just handled it so well. And she randomly got someone that was walking past phone, somehow knew how to call Australia and called my mum so I could talk oh. to my mum. No idea how she did that. Um, and she she was speaking to uh, the, the helicopter people and she even somehow forced herself to get on the helicopter with me, which was amazing because mm -hmm. they said no one had ever been able to come on a helicopter with the injured person before and she somehow talked her way into that. 
So yeah, she was a great support. And I remember also there was a policeman that arrived there before the helicopter or anyone. And I was just holding and squeezing his hand so much. And I found so much support in him, even though we literally never spoke a word to each other. Wow. It's amazing how someone can be that for you. And I have no idea who he is, no idea what he looks like. I'll mm-hmm. never see him again, but isn't that cool? Yeah, he's cool. So, like, yeah. so how, how long did you spend in Switzerland before getting, did you get medivac back to Australia? I think a month. So I, when I got to hospital, I went straight into surgery. I broke my pelvis as well as my back. So they operated on both of those. And then three days later, I had another surgery on my back. And this time they had to go in through the side. I don't really understand why. But in order to get to the spine from the side, they had to collapse one of my lungs. And apparently you can't fly for a month after that because they have to, I don't know. I think it's because um, yeah, breathing is important on the plane. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not like no, that. but the pressure would definitely, oh, definitely affect yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So after that, then I could fly home. And it was weird. It was a regular flight like Emirates or whatever it was, but a regular flight although they took down a lot of the seats in the middle and I was on a bed and I had a doctor and a nurse with me and like, um, what do you call the air? Oh, an air hostess? <laughs> um, no, Cab- cabin crew. the air that goes in your nose. Oxygen. Oh, oxygen. Oxygen. Yeah. That's, uh, I've heard of that before. Pretty crucial. <laughs> Yeah. I was, yeah. was going to call it you gas, but it's not. Imagine that, just feeding you gas. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been nice. And then I can, uh, yeah, I can, but I had yeah, yeah. nitrous oxide yeah. on the yeah. way. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But I had that as well. So as odd as the experience was, I wasn't having a good time emotionally, but it was really nice to be able to lay down for yeah. the entire flight. Mm. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. And then straight into rehab in, in Australia? Yep. So then I went to Sydney. I was living in Canberra, but there was no spinal ward in Canberra. Yep. So I had the next three months in Sydney. Uh, went into a spinal ward and stayed in there. Yeah, stayed in there for the next three months doing rehab, which I actually personally loved the whole experience of. I know that a lot of people, that was a really bad time for them. And obviously I think the component that I was, I was starting to heal while I was in there added to that. But I just found the nurses, the doctors, the physios and everyone else. I just thought it was amazing. And it was amazing to be around people that were going through the same thing as well. But in a, in a recent episode with, um, Sam Willoughby, uh, who's just a couple before you, he was, uh, you know, he had an accident which caused him to break his back and, you know, his diagnosis was this. What was your diagnosis when you came out? Did doctors say you'll walk again? It was a no. successful operation? No. So, well, the operation was successful, but I'm pretty sure that's just to stabilize the, the spine. spine. Cord, so it doesn't cut any more yeah. of it. Yeah, exactly. But so they'd said that I was an incomplete paraplegic. And basically what that means is that the spinal cord wasn't completely severed. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, I guess, squashed is more how you would put it. Well, I mean, the compact of just the the accident itself, of course. Well, we'll get into this because I was saying to this Angus off air before we chat, easily the most annoying thing in the world to me about my disability when people have a few beers and they come up and go, hey, mate, I know what you're going through. I broke my back once. Oh and look God. at me, I'm running around. Right? Yep. And I yep. go, brother, you didn't break your back. You broke a vertebrae. Your spine yep. didn't break. Completely yep. different thing. You wouldn't be Very walking around. Very different to the cord. Yeah. Correct. So sure. when oh. I found out about your story, I looked more into it. I was like, oh, she's not bullshitting giving me the vertebrae chat. You yep. actually damaged your spinal cord. Yeah. And especially now that I, I feel like I'm telling this story in a really bad order. Because if people don't know, I'm now walking. Um, but especially now that I am walking, I get the same thing a lot too. They're like, oh, I broke my back too. And it sometimes get pain, gets painful. I'm like, no, that's, that's like the least of my worries, yeah. the pain. Well, like there's still the bladder, the bowel, the everything else. We'll get to the rehab about yeah. and the walking in yeah. a sec. I just got to ask when you're first, when you first had your accident, you're in rehab, do yeah. you love yourself? Do you hate yourself? Is your life over? What are you thinking? Yeah. So the first, I'm going to say week when I was in Switzerland, I was just absolutely devastated. And as I said, I didn't know anything about the kind of injury. I didn't have anyone to look up to. I didn't, I just didn't know what it meant for me. And I was, I was so upset and so devastated to the point where I thought, and as I said before, I wasn't a strong minded person. I was like, there's no way I can get through this. Like I, I'm not the kind of person that can get through this. So I was just like, no, nah, I, like, I wish I died. That's how I felt. I was, oh, I was so devastated. But then one day, still when I was in Switzerland, I remember waking up and nothing had changed. Like the prognosis was still the same, which as I didn't say before, they, they said that I wouldn't walk again. Like they did the surgery and the surgery went well, but they were like, it's still like severely injured and you can't feel anything. You can't move anything. You can't use your bladder or bowel. Like that's probably just how it's going to be. Um, but one day I just woke up and I was like, okay. I've had this injury and there's nothing I can do to take it back as much as I want to. 
and I can either dwell on it for the rest of my life and let it consume me and be paralyzed and depressed, or I can be paralyzed and try to have a good life regardless and mm. just try, try my best to be happy. And if I do happen to get better, then amazing. But I don't want to make that the number one goal of my life. Mm. I, I think it's really weird. So Kelly Cartwright, who is a one-legged amputee, uh, she mm -hmm. lost to the curse of cancer. And she's a like, really good looking, uh, incredible athlete. And people always say to her, oh, it's so weird. Like this has happened to you. Mm. Like it what only, a shame it happened to you. shame it happened to you. Oh my God. You. I got that yeah. every day. So I'm going to ask yep. that about you because, you know, yep. you are good looking. You're really well spoken. You know, I guess the mold of what people think disability is, is not mm -hmm. you. So yep. what was the perception of everyone else when they were communicating and talking to you? So when I first got out of hospital. I was still in a wheelchair, obviously. And I would just, the first time I ever, I was so nervous to like get out in the world in a wheelchair because I, it just, everything seemed so new and so different. And so the first time I did venture out, it was like a really big deal to me. And then I had all these people coming up to me and it was like going out for dinner. So there were people who were like drunk around and yeah. people, but people I didn't know coming up and especially guys. And they'd just be like, what a shame, <sighs> like what a waste that it's yeah. happened to someone so pretty. And I was like, what? <laughs> First, so many elements to what it. First of all, do you think that people aren't, first of all, you think like, what a waste. Like there's nothing good left in me now. Mm. Me now. And also it just is like, what a horrific thing to say that people who are, I don't know, what they consider not good looking, they're more worthy of something bad happening to them. Yep, like so there's stupid. just so many elements to it that just grinded my gears. But I would, yeah, I would get that all the time. It's, um, it's something we do talk about often. It's a great way to weed out those people though, isn't it? Yeah. You don't have oh, to waste much yeah. time with people that you know is not the right kind of yeah, people you want to be around. For sure. Yeah. But it just, it blew my mind that mm. that's the way some people thought. I was like, fascinating. It's especially because especially you've had an accident. Like I've grown up with it. So you mm -hmm. become accustomed to it. But if you've gone from one extreme to the other and you're like, do people actually talk like this? They, yeah. It yeah. must be confronting. Exactly. I was like, I didn't know this was how people thought, like, I didn't, mm. I didn't know these people existed, but mm. here we are. But that is, that is very true that you learn a lot about a person and not just in that scenario, but in so many different things after having an injury, you really get to know someone who they really are a lot quicker. Oh, did you lose some people? You reckon? Oh yeah, but I, I definitely, but also in the sense of meeting strangers, like yeah. just the way they approach you or the way they, the questions they ask, the folk, the, what their focal point of wanting to know about you is, it just shows a lot about a person. So you know? you've, so you've, uh, oh, absolutely. It's a great, like I said, mm. it's a great way to weed people out. And the yeah. people yeah. around you, I mean, you only have to see you on social. We know that you're an honest person online. So mm -hmm. you've got the best group of friends around you. And I'm, oh, we yeah. share a very good friend, Liv, one of the greatest people of all. She is the best. Yeah. She really mm. is. Um, so you've gone into your rehab with the yeah. idea that you're never going to walk again. Yeah. When does that change? When does something, do you feel, start to move a toe? What, what happened? So still when I was in Switzerland, so within the first month, I could move my feet and legs a little bit. I still couldn't feel anything, but it just, and it's weird. There wasn't like one day where I magically woke up and it was like, I was like, oh, I'm getting better. It was so gradual and slow that it was kind of hard to notice. So there was like a little wriggle of the toe or like I could lift the bottom half of my leg up. And mm. even as that was happening, the doctors and physios were still saying to me, like, don't get excited, you know even if you can move a little bit, you're not going to be able to walk or mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to use crutches. Like, don't get excited. And then when I did um, get to, so from that stage, I then went to a walking frame when I was strong enough and I basically put all of my weight onto the walking frame and then could kind of drag my legs. And then from there, it went to two crutches and I was into on two crutches for quite a while. Um, that's how I left hospital, mm. mainly in my wheelchair, but also I could use crutches a little bit around the house. But even at that stage, they were like, you're not, like, this is as good as it's going to get. Like, don't get excited. You're still going to be in a wheelchair. Mm. So I, n I never, I don't know. I never had that feeling of, will I get better or will I want, I don't know. I just kind of was really open to whatever happened because there was this day in hospital, which I think was really pivotal to me. I'd been in there for a few months and this guy came into the spinal ward and he'd had his accident years before and he was in a wheelchair and he, we went out to the pub and he told me, he's like, I will never be happy unless I can walk again. And he'd had his accident years earlier and it was looking like he wouldn't, that probably wouldn't happen for him. And even though in my head at that point, I'd probably subconsciously thought the same thing when I heard him say it like that, like, I will never be happy unless I walk again. I was like, 
I need to make sure I don't think that way. Like I Good. absolutely cannot think that way. And even though I wanted to get better, obviously, I was like, I need to make sure that my number one priority in healing, even while I'm in hospital, is mental and emotional. And if I do happen to get better, then that's amazing. But I want to know that I'm okay regardless because I don't want to base my happiness on one one mm. thing. That Walk, might not happen. Walking, smoking, I say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? Exactly. Right yeah. I well was overrated. like, that's just, yeah, that's <laughs> one thing. And imagine basing your entire happiness for the rest of your life on on one specific mm. thing. Um, I think we should just clarify, and this coming from, hey, able-bodied Angus over here, but there will be a lot of people who just come in and tune into this episode, maybe because they want to hear more of your story, maybe because it's just the latest episode that pops up on their feed, et cetera. But um, we should point out what impartial paraplegic is um yeah. because uh, dylan you are as well in, 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 sorry, sorry incomplete paraplegic incomplete paraplegic because mm-hmm. dylan you are as well a lot of you've never walked but you can feel feelings in yeah your there's feet. a d- different level of incompleteness about how much of the spinal cord is damaged so if you break your spinal cord all the way across you're a complete paraplegic or quadriplegic from that spot all the way down mm-hmm. so uh, in my case i'll talk on my behalf emma you can do it on yours um I have like a, a lot less than Emma, to be honest. So uh, I have like a little bit left. So I have a bit of feeling, tiny bit of movement. I can have kids, things like that. Luckily for me, some people who are complete uh, will have to only have, they can have kids, but through IVF. So I can naturally try and have them, things like that. Um, uh, but, you know, my little bit of spinal cord you damage, uh, sorry, that isn't damage, gives me enough to like, if I got stabbed in the leg, I'd notice. If mm-hmm. I sat on a hot pot, probably wouldn't. For example, mm-hmm. yeah. so yeah. that's me. But yeah. when you say in, one big thing to think about disability, when you say, "Oh, they're both incomplete paraplegic," or oh, they're the same, it Very is a different. huge different brush, right? yes. huge breadth. And yeah. every single person I've met that's an incomplete paraplegic is totally different. Mm. Like there's, yeah, there's so many different elements that you you could have or you might not have. Like the, it's everyone's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, so, for me, if I was to get stabbed in the leg, I would not feel. Okay. I oh. S- yeah. So if I, um, so even though my movement has come back incredibly well, which I'm so stoked about, but I, I still, my calves are still paralyzed. So I still walk with a limp and all of the other muscles in my legs and bum are still a lot weaker. Hence why I walk with a limp and can't like run or jump or anything like that. But the movement, I mean, the sensation hasn't come back at all. So I can't feel from, from L1, which is where I broke, which is kind of like belly button ish level. Mm -hmm. I can't feel from there down at all. And that's so weird to think like, so I should clarify, I got stabbed in the leg. I wouldn't feel like Angus would. I'd be like, oh, that's a bit weird. Something's wrong. What's I feel? I feel a bit sick. Oh, hang on. So I got stabbed. Um, but that's weird because like I've got no movement muscle, whatever. Mm -hmm. Weird to think that you've got no feeling, but some muscle activation. Yeah. yeah so That's I an found unusual this, combo. Yeah. Yeah. Unusual. I found this very interesting and it's the people, I guess the thing people get most confused about, but so a doctor explained it to me and he said that there's two separate nerves. There's the nerve for um, motor and the, mo- and the nerve for sensory. And so just because one is severely damaged doesn't necessarily mean the other one is. Oh. So for me, my sensation is totally damage whereas the movement was less damaged and it's able to heal a lot better that's why for yes yeah, some people i have some people who can't friends that can't move at all yet they have full feeling it's like how how does that happen yeah. and so it's because yeah they're they go motor neuron disease things like that sort of fiction motors not nerves things like yeah. that i never thought yeah of that. i've yeah. never known that as well yeah, so my i must have a little bit of the nerve where you can still feel but my movement side would be cactus <laughs> yeah. So it's, yeah, it's so interesting. And then for me as well, I, so there's the bladder and bowel element. And for that, for me, they're both completely, like completely gone. Not nothing at all. Would you give up the walking to have full functioning bladder and bowel? No. Nah. Which is Ooh. interesting because I know. Yeah, I like I, this space. Yeah, I ask this question to all of my friends that have, yeah, whether they're paraplegic or quadriplegic, I'm like, what is the one thing that you'd want back? And everyone says, tell me if you're the same, everyone says bladder. Oh, bladder, it, yeah, it's a nightmare. Bladder and bowel. Yeah, yeah, it is a nightmare. I've, yeah. I've got a little bit of, I'm lucky compared to some people. Like, Once again, because you're para, uh, incomplete. Yeah, it can, can be like, you know, really, really tough. So you'd rather have walking than bladder and bowel? Yeah. Whack. Yeah. Why is that? I think, I don't know, <laughs> I'm just so used to um, catheters and enemas now. I, I honestly don't remember how it feels to pee normally or to be able to just sit down and yeah, mm. pee, pee now. Like I, I don't remember how you do it. Um, and I'm, I'm very used to, yeah, very used to using catheters. And as well as the fact that 
I don't know how this happened, but about a year, no, even less than a year after my accident, I just got so comfortable with the fact that I pee myself every single day. Even if I'm using catheters, I'll have accidents all day, every day. And I don't know how I got this confidence about it, but I'm so glad I did. I just do not care at all. Like I'll tell everyone I meet and I like do it in the street and I just there's stuff that, there's stuff, don't care. There's stuff Can't where control you, it. There's stuff you can, like meds you can do to, to help prevent that. I've I've tried a lot. Yeah, the urologists are very confused by me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Feels good. He's You are going to be yeah. killing it. Yeah, um, yeah. No, I've had a lot of different. I'm telling you, um, Vesicare, get on it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've tried. And okay, Botox? Yeah, yeah. Have you done the Botox? I did the Botox, yeah, the Botox. Yeah, it? yeah Botox it didn't work for me. Oh, yeah. Get, 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 anyway, we can Once again, well, horses for different courses. I've got a, I'm going to well, break horses the... Horses for different courses? Horses for no. courses. Horses, yeah, okay, that makes yeah. sense. You made it sound a bit weird. Okay. There's, um, usually we do a bowl of uncomfortable, M, which is at the end of the podcast. It's a question yep. that's sent through from people who are listening to our podcast or want to know more about a story, but I'm going to break the mold. Great. Uh, because we're in the space where... I was very excited for this part because I love awkward things. There you go. This <laughs> is the bowl of uncomfortable. It comes from our Instagram. It's Jasmine Violet. Thanks for your question, Jasmine. She's a fan of yours. Follows you as she says here. Hey, Em, my question is, do you ever get nervous when you leave the house that you'll lose control of your bowels or bladder? I know I have the same health condition, but with my epilepsy, when I have a fit, I lose bladder control. I'm always worried when I'm out that I'm going to have a fit and wet myself. Do you have similar thoughts when you're out? Um, I follow you in your journey and I know this is something you deal with because of your injuries, but I would love to hear from you. Hello, Jasmine. <laughs> um, no, I don't, I don't think that at all. I, I, I think because I know I will. So there's no point worrying about it or I would literally not ever go anywhere ever mm. cause I'd mm. be too scared. So I just accept that is going to happen. And I wear incontinence pads in case anyone was wondering, why doesn't you just put on a pad? And, <laughs> but even, even that is not enough sometimes. So I, I don't know. I just know that if I want to live a life where I can feel free and I don't have to feel anxious every single day, then I need to be fully accepting and okay with it. And I think the easiest way to do that is to be really open with the people around you and not keep it a secret. Mm. Because if, if you feel awkward about it, people feel awkward about it on your behalf. Do you drink alcohol? Uh, rarely. Oh but, God! Yeah. Once you break the seal, you'd be in big trouble. <laughs> I'm, I'm in big trouble. When I break the seal. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. It's yeah, but no, I, I yeah, I, I don't know. I just think it's just pee. Like, who cares? There is a there is a, obviously we share a friend and Liv said to ask. You know, you're very honest with the answer you just gave. But has there been any, any moments or situations um, where it has been less than ideal that it happened in that time? Any oh funny God. stories? Yeah. So. The pee side of it, who cares, whatever. Yeah. It could just be water. No one knows. And you can make bulk cash um, on some fetish sides if you had to as well. I've, What's up with you? Keep I've asking people. I've thought about this. Like, yeah. See? Yeah. And he just always bags me, right? <laughs> when I bring this up in December, he goes, why do you yeah. play this? And we all think about this. We think about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I feel fans. like there would be some people out there that would think this is the dream. <laughs> um, yeah. But no, as for when it comes to the other side of it, the bowels, yeah. number two, that is, I guess... I don't find it embarrassing. Well, there has been a time where I've been quite embarrassed, but I find it more so just frustrating because it's more so like you have to have a shower, you have to get changed, you mm -hmm. have to clean up, like you have to leave whatever you're doing to go and deal with it, which yeah. I find annoying. But yeah, no, there, there was a time where I was in the middle of Melbourne, CBD, and I'm not from Melbourne, so I don't get there. I don't go to cities very often. I was like, wow, there's a lot of people great, here. Great, great city. Yeah, great. And I was walking around and I was by myself and I was walking back to my hotel, which was still like 15 minute walk away. And then this very rarely happens this badly, but it just started like dripping down my leg and on the ground. And I was like, oh my God, I was like, what do I do? I was in shock. I was like, oh my God, what do I do? I can't get in a taxi or an Uber because like, I can't. Oh yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah. It'll be. And so I just had to keep walking to my hotel. It's all I could think to do. And people were like laughing at me, pointing at me, taking photos. I was like, this is going to be on Daily Mail tomorrow. Uh -huh. Um. And yeah, it was, it was such a weird experience for me because it was so, it was traumatic in the sense that I was just like, what, how, how do I have no control over this? And also because I'm walking, people wouldn't think that oh, there's shit. a reason I for forgot, it. Hang on. Yeah. She's walking oh, down shit. the street. I just forgot yeah. you're walking. Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, yeah, wait, so wait. It, yeah, Dylan's thinking in the chair. I'm like, no way. Yeah, I know a no. teammate, a guy I played basketball with once. We, we hated him. Happened him on court. Hilarious. We all laughed at him. Like, I'm like, <laughs> you're disabled. But I'm like, oh my God, you're walking around. Walking down the street. Yeah. yeah. So people. Yeah. Like a people bad Hansel and Gretel story. Yeah. yeah. People would, exactly. People wouldn't think there's a reason for it. 
So it would be very confusing to see. But yeah, not one person asked if I was okay or if I needed help. And then I had to walk into the hotel and it was like all in the hotel. And I was awkwardly standing in the lift with someone. Like it was just, it was horrific. So that was probably the worst scenario. I'm but so glad you could share that story and look back with a little bit of a smile yeah. on your face. But that would have been tough, the toughest moment at that time. Mm. And wow. yeah, the, the only thing I think could do, I was like, okay, just like put your head up and keep walking. Like if someone... If someone did come and ask me why it was happening and I told them, they would be like, oh my God, let me help you. Are you Mm. okay? So I think just having the internal knowing of like, you're actually really brave for doing this and living like this and being confident enough to go out. So if this is what happens, then like, it's okay, you know? Yeah. But but obviously people looking from the outside don't know that I was thinking like, good on you. <laughs> I've yeah, exactly. <laughs> well I've, done, Em. Good on yeah. you. I've, <laughs> you said, champ. I've, got, I've got a few mates. Who and have she been, works at Collingwood Street. <laughs> yeah. I've got a few mates who have been on a bender. They've shot themselves as well. That happens to everyone anyway. Yeah, so, people probably exactly just thought right. I was really drunk. Exactly right. I've always heaps of beers. How, yeah. how well do you walk? Like, well, I know that's hard to describe. Like, I feel like, you know, there's a lot of people with you know, paraplegia who might try and walk and they look a bit penguinish and I'm like, Mm -hmm. it's so slow to get from A to B. Why do you bother? I'm like, walking is overrated. Just get in a wheelchair. Your life's better. I honestly have that opinion, right? Yeah. So how well do you walk now? Um, I wouldn't say I'm too slow in the sense that like, if I was to walk down the street with friends, they'd probably only have to walk a tiny bit slower to go my pace. Um, but I, I would say I look drunk maybe. Like I've, that's probably how I would describe it. Like I've got denied from going into bars when mm. I literally haven't had a single sip of alcohol many times because they're like, no, you're drunk purely because of how I was yeah, walking. It happens to a lot of people with cerebral palsy that as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'd say, yeah, that's how it looks. But how, as for how it feels, it's, I've got, I've gotten a lot stronger. The muscles that are still paralyzed haven't changed at all. But I think just the muscles that are working, I've been out of strength in over the years. So I can walk a fair distance now and be okay, but it's just, I guess it's a lot more tiring than it used to be. So I'll have to take a lot more breaks or I'll have to, you know, a stretch mid walk because it's painful. Do you have like a kilometer limit? Like if you're going a K, you'll bring the wheelchair or are you anti wheelchair now? Are you no chair? Um, I used to, if I was going to like a shopping center or something where I knew it'd be a lot of back and forward walking, I'd take my wheelchair for that. And I was actually back in my wheelchair uh, a few years ago for a whole year because I had a injury on my foot. Back with the thing in how we were talking before about if you got stabbed in the leg, yeah, you wouldn't the feel feeling, it. Yeah, the feeling, yeah. Yeah, so I had a shard of glass in my foot, had no idea about it. And then it got super bad. Oh. And because the healing is so slow um, in my legs now, it took a year to heal and I couldn't put any weight on it in that time. So I was in my wheelchair for a year, oh. but I haven't used it since then so no yeah i think if i know there's somewhere that'll be a really big walk i'll be more likely to just take breaks throughout i had a a huge you like this story i had a huge night at a melbourne nightclub it was called tramp it was a yucky joint and i went there tramp massive one (laughs) went home and i fell asleep on my laptop my laptop was charging in my bed was it hot my kneecap was on my charger and i like slept for 12 hours and i'm dreaming man my knee's a bit sore and I oh rolled God. over, my kneecap had burnt off <gasps> and it took, now, now I've got a big, like big looking like a big tennis ball circle on my kneecap because yeah. it take <laughs> it took a year to heal. Yeah. Like, it took yeah. so long to heal. People yeah. don't understand. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's mind blowing. And I don't think the individual knows until they go through it. You're like, oh, I'm sure it'll heal fine. But it is so yeah. slow. Yeah. In the pr- so you, you have a scar now. I have a scar on my bum from the same thing. I said oh, on something well, say, hot. I, look at us <laughs> growing down on our disabilities. Um, <laughs> I can luckily feel my bum a little bit. So I know if I'm going to get pressure. Oh, really? sore, right? yeah. But I've got oh, mates, that's very nifty. Uh, a mate yeah. at mine who, uh, he used to play tennis with a guy called Ben Bear. He was younger and he had a pressure when he was 14 and he left it for six months and his bone was popping out because <gasps> he didn't know. Oh. Right. So same as you. And then if you get a little scar that, it, I mean, you don't sit in a wheelchair all day anymore, but that can be pretty dangerous, can't they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And that's why you're told to check, like check yourself every night and make sure there's no precious. Yeah, shout there. out to my but beautiful partner, Chantelle, who I love very much. Yeah. She checks my botsky for me in case yeah. I have a little precious. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so in the process of healing, um, we've talked a bit about the physical healing and the ability to get back on your own two feet and walk. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people who believe that you should do the thing that caused you some sort of trauma. Uh, for example, I watched a documentary recently on Mick Fanning. 
who was obviously attacked by a great white shark. And so what do you yeah. what do you do? Went to Tasmania, went to South Australia, jumped into Calypso Charter, and jumped into a tank with no the chance. sharks. No vibe. Yeah. This. Is there any thought that you would go back, not necessarily to Switzerland, but maybe skydive again? This will be better be a no. <laughs> well, okay. So I don't I don't know what the answer is. But basically I used to have that that same train of thought and I was like, okay, I'll go skydiving again. I felt I felt a need to do it. And I was like, when I do it, it will close the chapter, move on, happy days. And I used to want to do it with the same guy before I realized oh, that, what? that wasn't gonna happen. I'm looking, yeah, oh, I wanted looking to... at me, I'm like cringing, I'm like, absolutely <laughs> not. You are not going skydiving again. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think what helps is knowing that there was a reason it happened. It wasn't a freak accident. There were so many different reasons mm. why it happened and it was human error. So knowing, you know, if someone wasn't going to make those mistakes, it would probably be okay. That's why I don't I don't feel scared of skydiving. But anyway, a few years ago, I realized I didn't feel that need anymore. Like I felt like I've kind of closed that chapter in my life and I can move forward and I don't I don't need to skydive to prove any anything. Mm. But I, I do feel that if I one day woke up and felt like going skydiving, then I would. But, I, yeah, it doesn't feel like a need anymore. It's just yeah. if, if I got that urge, then I would do it. It's, it's funny that you say that because um, one of the this thing that happens when people try to justify skydiving, mm-hmm. they go, there's, you know, there's more accidents, you know, that happen oh, on the coconuts road. Coconuts falling on your head. Of course, yeah. but, like, right. there's. Three million cars on the road at any one point, and there's yeah, maybe like a thousand true. skydives happening throughout Australia yeah. a day. So yeah. the statistics don't work out. It is a very dangerous activity, and coming from a person like myself, I've done it twice. Um, so it is weird to know that you, at one point, you thought that that could bring some sort of clarity. But I'm, I'm kind of glad that you came to the realization that you didn't need to make the jump for that. Yeah. To tick yeah. the box, sort of thing. Exactly. I don't know. I just. How would your parents have yeah. felt if you said that you wanted to? I don't think I would tell anyone. If I was ever going to do it, I wouldn't tell anyone till afterwards. I would just literally drive myself, do it, and then be like, oh, well. Oh, that's good. <laughs> it's done. Yeah. And now I'm actually in a wheelchair. No, no, no I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah. So what about, so, you, I mean, it's pretty impressive, to be honest, about your recovery and things like that. And also the way that you share your story. I've got to say, are you doing like motivational speaking? Because you need to be. I still get super nervous. For oh, do- I would love, making, I would love to be doing hey, it, but I just get so nervous every time. Let's chat after this. You need to be making big cash out of this because this is yeah, great. Yeah, help me out. Um, what about your relationship status? You, you, you're so open about it on your Instagram. You've got a family, things like that. Can you take us into that part of your life? Um, do you think I have a daughter? Cause I don't. No, no, no. Your partner. Oh. But yeah, yeah. His name <laughs> Tom? No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. I have a boyfriend, Tommy, but I have, I always post pictures with my niece and everyone assumes she's mine and Tom's daughter, <laughs> but <laughs> she's not. Um, but yeah, so I met Tommy probably two years ago now at the gym and he's been great. Like I, I dated a few people before I met him and I don't know, it just, it was a bit different dating um, when I was new to having an injury. And I don't think it was necessarily that anyone treated me differently. It was more so that I was getting used to being in a new body and I was getting used to, I don't know, just so many adjustments that I probably made it harder than the actual person did yeah, that I was sure. dating. Hey, yeah. My biggest insecurities as well growing up and same when having an yeah. accident, you know, partner, relationship, sex, things like that. It's tough to come across. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. But yeah, no, Tommy's been amazing. He's great. Great. Plans, but- plans on kids? Um, I, I sure, like I would love to have kids one day. And also I have no idea how my body would go about that. I I don't know. I get asked that every day. I have no idea. And I feel like I'll just cross that. Oh, Uh, hang on. Stop. Um, Can you hear us? Has the ISDN cut out? Uh, Hang on two seconds. Em, can she hear us? No, she can't hear me. Can you hear me, Em? No. Uh, It just dropped out. Just a 15 minute extension. Hi there. I was just wondering, I had a, um, a line for the Gold Coast book um, and it's just cut out because it was for an hour, but the conversation's just gone over. So can I uh, reconnect it to Melbourne DAB8, please? Yep. Thank you. Yep.
Can you hear me? Easy. Hello. I am. Uh, oh, hey, hello. You got it. Good. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. All right. I'll just pick up where I ask. Yeah, go. Good to go. Yeah. So yep. can can you have? Children? Can you have kids? Uh, I haven't asked that question, to be honest. Um, I feel like I'm just going to cross that bridge when it comes to it. And I feel like that's not on my agenda for the next few years anyway. Okay. Well, you know what? There what? is this podcast out there called Listen Able. <laughs> and we actually interviewed a, 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 what was her name, man? The, ma- the mum who's a full paraplegic. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. We actually had a guest on and she was a full paraplegic and she gave birth like she naturally. carried the, naturally naturally carried, yeah had a c-section wow. so didn't yeah um but but she naturally did everything and i didn't yeah. know that either because i was asking amazing. so many questions like one i think oh, you know it's a bit easy if you're a male paraplegic because there's ivf and it's you don't have to carry the baby but it was i didn't know that so how cool is that yeah i feel like i'd i i imagine i would be able to and just have a c-section because i i don't know if i'd have the ability to push yeah <laughs> yeah and yeah. I think, I think she was also saying in her episode that the doctors don't really give you the choice either. No, she tried. Right. She right. wanted to have a natural it. birth and they're like, we she can't. She goes, uh, natural and the doctor's like, no chance. No. <laughs> they, yeah. Uh, but only because of the fear of the unknown for the doctor, she was saying like, we haven't done this before and you know, yeah. this, we know we can do it this way. Yeah. Um, so I've got two areas that I want to play in, um, before mm-hmm. we let you go. Uh, one of them is you just said then when you were talking, um, about Tom, your partner, mm-hmm. uh, you said injury instead of disability, um, when talking about dating life. And Mm -hmm. it is something that we did talk about at the top of the show. You feel a a certain way about, you know, you were, you are disabled. You're an incomplete paraplegic, but do you not associate yourself with that way? Can you take it? Oh, no, I I definitely do. I, I definitely do. I just sometimes wonder if, so one time I had to give a speech to, um, a group of people who all had spinal cord injuries and I was probably the only one walking. Mm. And I, I just wondered if in their heads they were like, you don't know, like you're not going through what we're going through, even though obviously so many elements I am, I just, and it's probably not even necessarily what they're thinking. It's just my perception maybe. There'll be an element of, element of that, to be honest. Yeah. Like the one thing about when someone has an accident, who's say from where I grew up or the school, what happens? A hundred people call me and say, you have to go see this person. They've had yep. an accident, right? And yep. the person in hospital rehab goes, I don't want to see Dylan Orcott. You think I'm going to be a Paralympian with a sexologist girlfriend and living this awesome life? Like that, that's bullshit. That's not going to be me. So they actually resent. And that's fair enough too, right? And if they mm-hmm. ever want to speak to me, I'll be there in a flash. But I yep. can understand that they push back on that because they might say, one, I'm going to walk again. That guy yep. can't. Or two, I won't live that life, you know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. Th- I guess it makes you, does that make you feel a bit, how does it make you feel? Does it make you feel a bit down or fraudulent that they might think that about you? Um, well, yeah, I, cause I get asked the same thing whenever someone's injured, they're like, can you come and visit? And there's a few, I don't know, a few things about it. Like the first, the first thing is I don't want to, I don't want to be like, and I will, I will never in my life say this, that like, if you do this or you yeah. do that, that's how you can walk. False, again. Because, false hope. Yeah, yeah. Because people always ask me and I, I totally get it. Like I would, I would ask the same back when I first had my accident. You just want to know like, what is it? Like, what's the secret? How did you walk again? Tell me and I'll do that. And people always say to me, it's because you are so positive or yeah. you were so determined or whatever. And that's all well and good. And I know people mean well. But it's just not the truth. Like it just came down to, I think, luck and the way that my spinal cord was injured. So I never want to go and visit someone that's going through that and and their family like so desperately ask me, like, please tell us how you did it. And me having to say, I like, I don't know. There's... You're scoring points with me. Yeah. I love that answer because um, I didn't know you personally and I was hoping, oh, the energy and the mindset. It's like, that, there is an element of that, but there's an element of like, nah. if your spinal cord's cut, you can't walk, right? I or know. whatever it is. So I love hearing yeah. you say that because yeah. I, that what I have friends now who spent 150 grand in America trying to walk again and yeah. they're all... You know, you can go there, but they might not be, they're a bit scrupulous. They're, they're trying to potentially take your money, but people have that dream. And it's from reading things like, oh, you drink green tea and do that three times a exactly. day and you walk. And I'm like, look, 
that, that unfortunately ruins people's life sometimes because it just might not happen for them. Yeah, I know. And to be honest, that's why I say no to doing mo- most podcasts or things like that, because they, they always say to me, like, I don't know, it's like mindset is key, like teaches about your mindset of how you were strong enough to walk again. And I'm like, come on, mm, like, on, I'm yeah. not going to feed into that at all. And yes, I was positive And yes, I like tried so hard in rehab, but that's like, that's not it. And I'm mm. never going to pretend that it is. Cause I know that there is a few people who have learned to walk again. And when they speak about it, they do public speaking and it's, it's all about mindset. Yeah, and I'm like, wanky. come on. Yep. Yeah. I'm like, come on. You can't say that to people. <laughs> and my second part, M, and the final question that we'll ask you is you talked about the 20 year old before she jumped in that helicopter in Switzerland and being a bit negative, not knowing, yeah. really knowing her place. Yeah. Would you describe it? Obviously it's a life changing moment. Mm -hmm. Would you describe it as a life changing moment for you without the injury itself for mindset? Oh my God. I think about this so often. I was thinking about this just yesterday. I'm currently writing a book and I was writing about this very topic. Mm. So do you mean the sense that if I, if I got up from that accident and walked away, like, would it still have been life changing? Would you have still been the 20 year old who was, you know, not sure who she was and a bit glum? If you didn't, if you weren't a paraplegic. Or the person you are now, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I, what I think has, has had one of the biggest impacts in, uh, I guess, the mental recovery for me was the fact that I was awake for the entire accident in itself. And so even though that was so traumatic at the time, the fact that I, you know, I, I felt my, my body go from being totally okay to totally not okay. I felt that without any unconscious moment in between. I think that was so important for me to feel that because I was forced to realize in an instant, like how, how lucky I was to first of all survive because I saw how close I was to not surviving. Mm -hmm. And also I felt such a, like, um, I, I just felt so strongly in that moments afterwards of how lucky I was for my entire life beforehand to be in a body that was completely able. And I not once stopped to be grateful for that. And I, I, I often wonder if people who have woken up, I don't know, a week or so after their accident or they've had an unconscious moment in between, if they don't feel that like overwhelming sense of gratitude for their body and their life that I got to experience during that fall. So I really do think that if I, if I got up from that and I wasn't injured, it still would have been such a a life changing thing for me to, to be realizing in the fall, like, oh my gosh, I'm about to die. I don't want to die. I love my life so much. Like that was the part that was really that really changed my perspective on everything. Well answered. Final one we ask, if you can go back in time and on that day, would you still jump out of that plane or not? Everyone asks this, don't they? Um, Everyone asks me the same question too. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Like overall, my life is much better for it. A hundred percent. My perspective is completely different. I'm a much happier person and my life is just filled with so much more joy in so many ways. Um, but do I, like, would life be easier living without this injury? A hundred percent, like a hundred percent. Even the fact that I'm walking, there's so many things each day that is, it's like there's, there's pain involved and there's frustration and there's a lot of expenses, not to mention, like it would be so much easier to live without, without this disability. But I don't, I still don't think I would change it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was about to say, you got some splinters with that answer (laughs) on the fence, but but you I like it. I just, I never want to say like, oh no, I would do it again in a heartbeat and it's all been happy days since then because, yeah. you know, that's, that's not how it is. So I kind of, I kind of listened to this as like you, that op- the accident gave you a chance to rebuild and you just yeah. started with strong foundations and yeah. then look, now you've got a great outlook. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bloody hell. <laughs> How's it like that? I tell you what's also <laughs> a bit too good for my liking, how good the name of your movie slash book's going to be, The Girl Who Fell From The Sky. That's it's bullshit. Stupid. That is too good. It's so dramatic, isn't oh, but it? But I like, can I be a part of that? Like, I need to be in that movie. It's pretty good. <laughs> I remember when an article was first written about my accident, they called it like the big title on the front of the newspaper was The Girl Who Fell to Earth. And I was like, that's pretty good. And I was mm. like, I can make it no, better. you can make that better. Make better. <laughs> yeah. And you have. And I, I read that and I was like, damn it, that's pretty good. It's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty stoked about it. Like, oh, I'm just so glad it was an exciting way to be injured. You oh, know what man. I mean? Hey, I had a tumor wrapped around my spinal cord. That's Yawn. boring as bad shit to bed that <laughs> oh, story. Oh, what a boring story. I was oh. I was in hospital with a guy that literally just fell backwards of a chair. I'm like, yeah. oh, that sucks. <laughs> I knew someone who put a foot on a soccer ball and just slipped. Bang. Yeah. I was like, that's lame. You got to pret- you gotta make up another story if that's yeah. the case. You got to, yeah. I played basketball with a guy who got um, 
he was like in a How game. many people have you played basketball with, mate? A I lot. mean, Jesus There's Christ, you've gone through half the Harlem Gold. He, he got a shot. lot of tennis, a lot of basketball. He got, yeah. shot, he got shot by a gang, but it was they weren't trying to shoot him. They were trying to shoot his cousin. He goes, can I borrow your car to his cousin? And then he got shot with like 100 bullets with a machine gun. Yeah, that's interesting. Get him on the podcast deal. And that's how 50 oh Cent started his career. Uh, and I'm like, oh, I had a tumor and I had a <laughs> Yeah. At m underscore Kerry on Instagram, mkerry.com. And uh, you should also, uh, you're a t- very talented artist at M Kerry Designs, where you do some really beautiful um, contemporary pieces. Oh, thanks my, so much. My girlfriend I've never heard Emily's anyone like, refer to it as contemporary. Well, my girlfriend <laughs> wants to put a piece in your art because you put it with your frame of that beautiful light wood. It's gorgeous. Are you uh, angling for some free stuff here? No, no, yeah, absolutely not. I mean, People go pay. You've got to pay the pay. Um, <laughs> M, thank you so much for being the most requested person and answering the call. We really appreciate it. Uh, this episode's going to reach a lot of people, and I think it's going to do a lot of good. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, Amy Legend.